there's something intriguing about performing a two-handed task with only one, and typing is no exception. While practicality is definitely a factor, executing fast finger movements in a sequence successfully is simply satisfying. So in this video, I'm going to be talking about how I designed a custom keyboard layout for one-handed typing and my experience using it. There's no specific reason, I just wanted to try. Also, keep an eye out for note numbers in one of the corners that you can follow to the description for cool but ultimately non-crucial details and clarifications that didn't make the final cut. First, there is some context to provide when it comes to general keyboard layout optimization. The basic idea is to place the most commonly used English letters and letter sequences in the most accessible locations, often the so-called home row. In doing so, more words can be typed with less finger movement, presumably leading to faster speeds. Looking at the Dvorak layout, which is what I use, you can see that the home row consists of A-O-E-U, H-T-N-S, common English letters. Dvorak and other layouts, such as Colmac, Beacle, MTGAP, etc., all use a similar core concept. And in fact, you may have heard an urban legend that QWERTY, the standard layout for English, which seemingly lacks these letter frequency optimizations, was designed intentionally to slow typists down so that early typewriters wouldn't jam. Well, this is probably not true. Early typewriter history seems to indicate that key configurations were actually developed in conjunction with Morse code receivers to streamline the translation process. A study on the topic is linked in the description. And in a sad turn of events for alternate layout users like myself, modern evidence in the form of typing tests and competitions also shows that QWERTY is not inherently slower than other layouts. So overall, why doesn't layout seem to affect speed? Logically, less finger travel should mean faster times. Well, I think a big contributing factor is that when touch typing, your fingers act in parallel. Consider a sequence such as T-H-E. As one finger reaches for T, your other fingers are already moving towards H and E, ready to go as soon as T is pressed. This effectively means that time spent moving your fingers any larger distance is masked by time necessarily taken from previous movements. This movement pipelining is a general technique independent of the specific layout, resulting in negligible speed difference between them. But speed is not the whole story when it comes to layouts. Alternate configurations can still just feel more comfortable to type on and potentially reduce finger strain, though your mileage may vary. As an extreme example, imagine if the spacebar were placed in, say, the top left corner of the keyboard. Think about how often you need to use space and the extra strain your pinky would end up experiencing constantly having to reach that far. Hold on, isn't there a pretty common key in the top right of the keyboard? I've actually been working on a tool that can find an optimized keyboard layout to fill in some of the gaps that I think existing configurations have not addressed. I am planning a video that dives into more detail once the tool is finished, but as a prototypical test, I figure finding a one-handed layout may be interesting. I'll be focusing on the left hand since I already have the sinisterity built up from one-handed speed cubing, but everything can simply be mirrored for the right hand. Okay, so I know I just said that layout doesn't improve speed and blah blah blah. And now I'm going to say the opposite. That's because when it comes to one-handed typing, I believe that key arrangement matters a lot more. There are fewer fingers to act in parallel, meaning there's less potential time save from that so-called movement pipeline. As such, it should be worthwhile to make common keys more accessible. But before discussing my design, it is worth mentioning why I'm not just learning an existing one-handed layout, besides wanting to test my tool, of course. In fact, if you're interested in the topic, one of these pre-existing solutions may suit you better. The first category of layouts is those using a full keyboard. Of course, you could simply use QWERTY with one hand, which would be the easiest to learn, but there are also right and left-handed Dvorak variants. My main issue trying these is that I do not find reaching and hand movement very comfortable, and it's worse for me since I've recently been using keyboards with stuff in the middle, like a trackball or a numpad. So these are out of the question. 
The second category is half keyboard designs. Of these, mirrored layouts do already exist. There is an XKCD blog post about mirrored QWERTY and a very expensive Matthias keyboard realizing the concept. Nowadays though, you can make your own mirrored keyboard fairly easily. Most even budget customs have some kind of support for key remapping via a GUI utility, so programming isn't even necessary. Anyway, these effectively cut the keyboard in half and designate a key that, when held, overlays mirrored versions of each half onto the other. Keep in mind that for this animation, I'm only showing what happens to the left-handed side. Also, this depiction is a dramatization. The changing is basically instantaneous. While mirroring does significantly reduce the learning curve, I don't believe it's the best arrangement for speed and comfort. That leaves custom half-ish sized keyboards. Of particular note is the Maltron single hand keyboard, fitting the extra necessary keys into a well shape for better access. While a cool idea, it unfortunately seems to lack some customizability and comes in at over $300 making it hard to justify for experimentation. I do have experience building and wiring my own keyboards, the most similar of which being the Dactyl Maniform, but it isn't something I feel like doing at the moment. Instead, I'll be fitting my layout onto the Nyquist pad, a five x six macro pad that itself is half of a slit keyboard called the Nyquist from Keeb.io. I'm using Chaos Fox x Kale Arctic Fox switches, a mouthful I know, they're clicky, and on the lighter side, and the keypaps are DSA Royal Navy. So, how am I going to fit everything I need into 30 keys? Well, that's where layers come in. Layers are just like the FN key common on laptops or Alt-GR on many non-US keyboards. Hold this extra modifier and new keys will be layered on top of the base ones, allowing access to additional functionality. In fact, mirroring, as shown previously, can be considered a special case of layering. There are many more nuances I won't get into here, but basically all custom firmware gives you complete control over layer keys. I'll leave a link in the description for those interested. Now, let's talk about the three main properties I want my one-handed layout to have. One, of course, letter frequency. The biggest factor is placing commonly used letters in the most accessible locations. And keep in mind that for simplicity, I'm just going to call any typeable thing a letter, even if it's actually like enter or shift or something. More on how key accessibility can be quantified later, but as discussed previously, this criteria makes sense. Easier to reach letters should take less time to type. Two, roles. Just placing letters based on frequency isn't the whole story. In particular, one fast and generally comfortable typing technique is known as rolling. Essentially, this is some sequence of letters that can be typed with different fingers moving either strictly left to right or strictly right to left. Such a motion can be performed with a small and fast wrist rotation or roll, hence its name. So I want to place common letter sequences in configurations that enable rolls. Three, same finger sequences. I also want to minimize how many times I need to use the same finger twice in a row, as otherwise I would have to wait for the key to rise up gamers, before I could tap it again. While less of an issue in a two-handed layout due to the extra space, this needs to be carefully tuned for with only five fingers. Now the question is, how can an algorithm optimize for these criteria? At a high level, the process works as follows. First, the algorithm generates some number of random layouts, say 1000, and scores how good they are. One such approach for scoring is to assign some kind of effort value to each key position in the layout, and then sum up the total effort required to type some sequence of text. Lower overall effort is better. For such text, I'm using some novels from Project Gutenberg, maybe not the most representative for modern English, but good enough. Next, the algorithm takes the best, say, 25% of the layouts and modifies and combines them to generate 1,000 new ones. These 1,000 then form the basis for the next round of scoring and pruning. 
The idea is that by constantly operating on the best layouts of each round, the good features win out and are passed on to the next generation. So over many runs, layouts are constantly being refined to have more accessible common letters, many roles, and minimal finger repetition. What I've described is a very basic genetic algorithm, and as mentioned, I'm planning its own dedicated content piece since there are a lot of interesting details to cover. In the meantime, you can check out a video by user Adam Codes, who also utilizes a genetic algorithm to find a keyboard layout. Their simpler assumptions are a good starting point for understanding how such a process works in general. Okay, now onto the actual layout. The depiction is relatively straightforward. A letter in a certain position indicates that tapping the key will type the letter. More interesting is the layer changing. Specifically, consider up arrow 2, indicating that this key will activate layer 2. Also not shown are additional layers for typing numbers and symbols. They aren't important for this demonstration, so I've left them out. This key map has two more grids associated with it, and they can help illustrate how the three criteria are quantified for the algorithm. First, as alluded to, I can estimate the effort required to reach each position in the grid. You can see my effort grid on screen now. The left side is towards my left hand pinky, and the right side is towards my left hand index finger, with the bottom locations being for my left hand thumb. Positions are also colored, such that lower effort positions are a lighter shade. These values are kind of abstract units, and mostly represent the accessibility of a particular position relative to others. As expected, the core of the board requires low effort, while outer keys and awkward reaches require high effort. With a way to calculate the effort for a particular letter, the algorithm can try to minimize the overall effort it takes to type some sequence of text, covering Criterion 1. It does require some trial and error to get an idea of what feels right to you, but it is extremely flexible. By tuning the effort grid, you can favor certain positions and fingers and even hands to your own preferences. Pulling up a letter frequency chart, you can see common letters are placed in relatively low effort positions. E, T, A, I, N, S. For a letter like R, despite requiring a layer switch, you can see that the location of the layer switch, up arrow 2, and the location of R, 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 both low effort at 0.5, meaning the overall sequence can be calculated as the sum of the two, coming in at a fairly low effort total of 1.0. Second, I can assign specific fingers to each grid position. Generally, this is done via columns, where the left two most columns are assigned the pinky, the next two are assigned the ring in the middle, and the rightmost two are assigned the index finger. You may not prefer strict column to finger assignments in the home row style, but I generally find that using a consistent base position is more comfortable and less frustrating. I especially don't like looking up and down between screen and keys. When encountering a sequence of letters, the algorithm checks which fingers are used and applies an effort penalty to those sequences that repeat the same finger, fulfilling Criterion 3. Now, what about rolling? For this, let's look at some common two and three letter sequences. As mentioned before, T-H-E is one such sequence. My layout facilitates this in the second row from the top, as you can see. A less obvious example is E-R. To type this, I start on E in the middle row with my ring finger, then I move to the layer switch key with my middle finger, and finally I finish on R in the newly switched layer with my index finger. Again, the animation has layer switching exaggerated. In practice, it is instantaneous. Anyway, such a sequence is basically the ideal roll. It may seem strange to need three keys to type two letters, or rather two keys to type one letter, but this is a trade-off due to the limited space. The idea is that the efficiency of the roll to type a relatively common sequence will offset the extra key press needed. From the algorithm standpoint, when it encounters a text sequence that can be typed with a roll, an effort reduction can be applied fulfilling Criterion 2. A final note, despite having such limited space, why are some keys, such as E and I, repeated? 
Well, the short answer is that this is a trade-off between the various criteria. Based on my specific tuning, improving the type ability of common sequences containing E and I and reducing same finger usage is more important than the loss of space. And now, probably what y'all were actually waiting for, the typing demo. I've been doing a lot of monkey type. Depending on when this video comes out, about an hour a day for a little over a month. But let's get to it. I can't say what the top potential speed of this layout is, but I'm aiming to reach around 80 words per minute on longer passages, which what I expect will take more specialized practice and grinding. I can definitely feel myself being limited by my thinking rate, unable to recall fast enough the location of keys. That said, I don't think this is the final layout. While it is optimal given the assumptions I've made, I can't claim that the assumptions I've made are optimal and I'll need more experience to make that determination. There are still some new ideas and implementations that are worth trying out nonetheless, and as a whole, I am pretty satisfied with the outcome. So that ended up with a lot of tangents, but I hope you were able to get an idea of some of my design considerations. There are of course a lot more nuances and aspects I wasn't able to cover, so if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. Also, if you're familiar with QMK and want to give this layout a try, see the description for a link to the keymap files as well. I'll also link the GitHub repo containing my tool. It isn't yet in a usable state unless you're familiar with Julia and are willing to comb through source code, but it's there nonetheless. And as I mentioned, I will be making a video dedicated to a bit more of the technical details as there were a lot of interesting challenges I had to solve. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this long-winded discussion about keyboard layout design, and I'll see you again next time.